Hello, <laughs> welcome to an adventure. I hope you can see and hear me all right. Um, <laughs> as always, things are set up differently today. Uh, so we're gonna go with what we have and hopefully it all works properly. Um, hopefully you can hear the music and you can hear me and everything looks okay. And you know, we're just gonna have an adventure cause we usually do. Um, so I want to say welcome. Uh, today's topic is Thanksgiving. Uh, we are closed next week, so there will be no stream next Wednesday, which is why we're talking about Thanksgiving today. Um, I do want to make sure that we go ahead and we talk through, or we... I want to make sure that I take a moment to read the Land and Labor Acknowledgements uh, from the University um, I do this every week, but I do think that it is especially important to um, pay attention to what the university is saying around the indigenous populations, especially around this time of year. So I want to go ahead and read this out. Um, and of course, if somebody has questions about this, feel free to ask. I can't say that I will know the answer because I was not personally involved in developing the language here, so I don't know all of the initiatives. But if you want to ask the questions, ask the questions. Uh, so Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tutelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring native peoples without explicit material com commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tutelo and Monacan peoples and other native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual co commitment to utprosim that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. 
So that is the official statement from the university. Revised this year um, to make it more explicit in requiring an actual uh, in requiring actual action uh, rather than just nice words to say, hey, this was once their land and we're here now. Um, revised earlier this year to require a little bit more specific language about um, increased recruitment and stuff like that, which I think is a step in the right direction. Uh, but I, I like to highlight it at the beginning of every stream. Um, also, you know, it is Thanksgiving time and we have a lot of um, fictional narratives about the indigenous population around this holiday. Um, so extra important to kind of pay attention to the history, the moral act, and how it uh, removed people from lands for the land grant institutions to be founded. Um, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, hi, Sincerious. Thank you so much for bringing over people from your stream. Welcome in everybody from Sincerious's stream. Um, welcome to Archival Adventures. Uh, I am, well, you would know me as Rogan27 since that's the channel you rated into. I am also streaming on the um, VTUL Studios Twitch channel, uh, which is where I'm streaming from today. I am the um, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. And today's stream, we are looking at materials from the archives here. So once a week on Wednesdays, I do a uh, stream here from the archives. If you want to see um, the rest of my personal Twitch schedule, that will be below, uh, below the, the window on your page there. Um, but once a week, I stream from the archives here, and we share materials from the archives at Virginia Tech. And today, we are focused on the US holiday of Thanksgiving. Um, and so there's going to be stuff about turkey, and there's going to be stuff about cranberries, and there's going to be Thanksgiving menus from history. And so that's kind of what's going on on the stream today. Um, and we, we just got through doing kind of the introduction to the stream. Uh, I just did the land acknowledgement. Um, so yeah. Uh, we're going to go on an adventure, like I said, uh, looking at materials related to the holiday of Thanksgiving in the United States. Um, and then I'm trying to remember, uh, we will not have a stream next week. The week after, however, I wanted to mention what we were going to be doing then. Nope. I'm trying to get to it on my phone and I cl keep clicking all the wrong apps. Uh... <laughs> Hi, was not worth it. Um, there it is. There's the spreadsheet I wanted. Uh, yeah, so this week, like I said, Thanksgiving. Next week closed. The week after, we will be stream streaming on December 1st, which is International um, AIDS Awareness Day, World AIDS Day, sorry. And um, I will be sharing materials from uh, our archives that are focused on AIDS Awareness Week, which was something that Hokie Pride, the, uh, the university's LGBTQ organization, um, did starting in the 80s. And uh, it has it lasted for quite a long time here, so we'll be looking at some of that material in two weeks on World AIDS Day. So that is the plan. Um, I'm gonna, let's see, trying to decide what I wanna start with. I have a variety of things to look at today. I think we're going to start with a published book, though, uh, from our Rare Books collection. And let me just prepare that. OK. So what we're going to start with, so I have a whole cart of stuff uh, from a variety of collections. And we're going to start with a book called Giving Thanks. Um, I'm just going to hold it up here next to me so that you all can see it. Hi, Orangitis. Welcome in. Um, so this is Giving Thanks, Thanksgiving Recipes and History from Pilgrims to Pumpkin Pie uh, by Kathleen Curtin, Sandra L. Oliver, and uh, Plymouth Plantation. Um, so we won't be reading a lot of it because it is a published work, but we are going to take a look at it because it has some really good um, history of this holiday. And hello, 16-Bit Eric. Um, thank you so much for bringing over the whimsies. Uh, welcome to um, my channel. 
Uh, I am currently co-streaming to the VTUL Studios channel and my own channel, Rogan27, where you just raided. Um, I am Rogan27, welcome. This is my regular Wednesday stream uh, called Archival Adventures, where I bring you materials from the Special Collections and University Archives at Virginia Tech. Um, so that's Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University, where I am the Community Collections Archivist. And today's topic, what, what I dug through our archives to find information on, is the United States holiday Thanksgiving. So um, I've got some history, I've got some historical menus, I've got some recipes that we'll look at, I've got some stuff about um, like advertisements for turkeys from the past and stuff like that. So it, it should be a fun time. Um, but welcome, Adventures of Tony. Rykar01, thank you so much for the resubscription. 11 months. Um, uh, DJ Phoenix, welcome. Crafty Becky, just here for coffee. Bree Danan, welcome. Uh, Shiny Marigold, hello. Um, so for those of you who rated in on the Rogan27 channel, I will just mention I do stream four times a week on that channel. Uh, if you want information on the other streams, which are gaming streams, uh, that information is below on the page. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail on that because this is something that I co-stream for work and uh, also stream to my personal channel. So um, we're gonna dive in. Uh, so as this is an archives stream and I am an archivist, if you have questions about archives and historical preservation of documents and things like that, feel free to drop them in the chat. Uh, if you have questions or commentary about the stuff that we're looking at, feel free to uh, also provide that. Um, also, I will say, if there's anybody who happens to be in that chat who does not already follow Sincerius or 16-Bit Eric, uh, those two raids came in, and so uh, I will say, go ahead and give them a follow. I'll throw some shout outs in here. Um, did I spell it right? Yes, I did. So if you don't already follow them, go ahead and give them a follow. Um, both wonderful people and great streamers. So I was just getting to our first item. I'm gonna switch us over to the document view so that you can see what I'm looking at. And what I have here, what we're starting with is a book called Giving Thanks, uh, Thanksgiving Recipes and History from Pilgrims to Pumpkin Pie. This is a published work from our um, rare books collection. So it is under copyright. I can't share everything in it. It's from 2005, so relatively new. Um, but thank you just here for coffee. <laughs> thank you for sharing the schedule information. I need to put a command in the, in the um, Moobot for you all. Uh, the reason that I wanted to highlight this um, is because it has some nice historical information at the beginning of it. Um, this is put out by Plymouth, Plan Plymouth Plantation. Um, and so while I don't want to share all of their stuff, because it is under copyright and they sell this book, um, it starts off with a chapter called 1621, The First Thanksgiving and discusses the American conception of the first Thanksgiving meal. So I, I will read a little bit, just some excerpts here. Every American is familiar with the traditional Thanksgiving meal, roast turkey with stuffing, cranberry sauce, sweet potatoes, and of course, pumpkin pie. As we eat these classic dishes year after year, we have a sense of con a continuing tradition that began with the pilgrims and Indians. And that's in quotation marks, uh, pilgrims and Indians. But are these really the foods the English colonists and native Wampanoag ate together during the harvest celebration of 1621, the event that has come to be known as the first Thanksgiving? So when I was looking for items for this stream and I came across this book, I was leery. I, I was worried about how it would present the history of Thanksgiving. Um, and when I started looking at 
like I opened it up to here and read that first paragraph and the fact that it put pilgrims and Indians in quotation marks and specifically named the tribe, the Wampanoag, those are good signs to me as to how it approaches the topic. Uh, because it is a delicate topic where a lot of the history has been misrepresented, especially to school children. Uh, we simplify things for school children all the time, and then as they grow up, we expect them to just accept the increasing nuance in the history that they were taught as kids, and some people just can't. Uh, they can't make that adjustment, and so that's why there's a, oftentimes a lot of argument over what is our history. Uh, because we're taught one thing as kids and we're told it repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly and then we come to discover that it wasn't actually true um, and that is a, a large adjustment for people to make um, some would argue that that's the same thing as like we're taught santa claus is real and the tooth fairy is real um, but we get over those but when it's actual history that's being misrepresented to children that's a different thing than a fairy tale creature uh, anyway <laughs> So, um, overall, I'm, I'm interested in this book. Uh, it says, there may have been turkey. Wild turkeys were plentiful in New England, and both the native Wampanoag and the English colonists ate them. So that is good to know. <laughs> Happy 400th anniversary of pie and arguments. Yes. Um, so then it has, in a call out here on page 14, a specific discussion of Wampanoag traditions of giving thanks. Uh, so uh, the American custom of Thanksgiving did not begin with the arrival of the European colonists. Giving thanks for the Creator's gifts is an integral part of Wampanoag daily life. From ancient times up to the present, native people in North America have held ceremonies to give thanks for successful harvests, for the hope of a good growing season in the early spring, and for other good fortunes such as the birth of a child. Giving thanks was the primary reason for ceremonies and celebrations. During the 16th and 17th centuries, Europeans came to our homeland. They commented in their writings about all the wonderful foods that were found in nature and the richness and abundance of berries, wild grapes, fish and shellfish, deer, wild turkey, and more. The people indigenous to this area were well aware of this abundance. For generations and generations, the Wampanoag knew of certain times and seasons to collect the berries and medicines from plants, when to hunt and fish, and how to ensure that there would be food for the future generations of their people. One of those ways was in the daily giving of thanks for the abundance of materials that were given from the Creator for everyday life. By keeping gratefulness in mind, the Creator's gifts were not taken for granted. Thankfulness was woven into every aspect of Wampanoag life. If an animal was hunted for food, special thanks were given to the Creator and to the spirit of the animal. If a plant was harvested and used for any purpose, if a bird or fish was taken, even if an anthill was disrupted, acknowledgement and gratitude were given for the lives that were taken. To this day, it is the same with most native people. <laughs> Good tea with archives. Awesome, Adventures of Tony. I'm glad that you're enjoying uh, some tea with our archives stream. So there's some illustrations in here. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time because like I said, this is a copywritten book. If you want the book, uh, it is called Giving Thanks, and so if you search for Giving Thanks Plymouth P Plantation, that's P-L-I-M-O-T-H, uh, Plymouth Plantation, Giving Thanks should help you find this book if you are so interested. Um, <clears throat> but there are a couple of, so it, it goes through a lot of like history of the traditions around Thanksgiving, um, there's some lovely illustrations in it. Here, mincemeat, plum pudding, and pies. Um, if you have never had a mincemeat pie, uh, I would not be surprised. If you have had one, I also wouldn't be surprised. Mincemeat is one of those things that, growing up, it was associated with grandparents for me. And it wasn't until I started making pies that I understood what mincemeat was and discovered that it is a really good pie. Um, so 
uh, here, mincemeat was an important addition to the daily farm diet in the winter as well as to the Thanksgiving celebration. Most butchering was done in the autumn, both to take advantage of the cold weather for preservation and to avoid having to feed livestock through the winter. Thus, the ingredients for mincemeat, bits and scraps of beef or venison, including tongue, neck, meat, and feet, were available in November and December, making mincemeat used up and preserved these scraps for later eating. And the addition of suet, the hard fat from beef, seasonally available apples, and sometimes cider produced a delicious food suitable for celebrations. Now, I will note, if you go out and buy mincemeat at your grocer today, at least in the U.S., I don't know about in other countries, but if you go to the grocer in the U.S. today and buy some prepared mincemeat, it will have a little bit of beef suet in it, and that's it. It won't have any of those other bits of meat. It's mostly apples and nuts and stuff like that, as well as spices. Um, but the traditional version did have some of that meat in it. Um, but yeah, you end up uh, some menus and other illustrations in here. The illustrations in here are really, really nice. Um, but I don't want to spend too much time on this book because we have some actual menus and advertisements to look at. Um, but I did want to highlight this and kind of touch on like the topic of Thanksgiving and what its perception is in this country. The fact that it's uh, it's portrayed to children as um, the native people inviting the pilgrims in and throwing them a big feast um, at harvest time. And while there is evidence that a feast did occur, um, there's a lot more to the story than just the Wampanoag inviting the pilgrims to sit down to a meal. Uh, and so uh, this book appears to actually go into some of that and look at the traditions that the Wampanoag had initially prior to that and why they might have invited people over for a meal, um, as well as some of how the story of Thanksgiving evolved over the years. Um, so, how about we start looking at some menus? because there was talk of some menus uh, and I know I pulled some. I just have to see which folder they're in. Culinary pamphlet, advertisements, poultry sciences. Is it here? I think that one might, and that one's got menus. Got a couple of menus here. Mincemeat sounds like it filled the same niche as Scrapple. Um, yeah, I think so. I haven't thought about Scrapple in a long time. <laughs> we, we had Scrapple as kids. Scrapple is kind of a New England, or not even, I don't know, Southern New England thing. Uh, I know of Scrapple mainly as being um, associated with like Pennsylvania area, if, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, but it's generally uh, mid-Atlantic. Thank you, was not worth it. That is a good definition. So Scrapple is kind of like a, a meat bits that you fry up, essentially. It's, it's just a way to use kind of leftover meat. Uh, Mincemeat nowadays in the UK is usually veggie suet. Oh, I haven't seen it done with veggie suet. Uh, currants, raisins, citrus peel and orange, and lots of sugar, like a very heavy preserve, without the pectinized juices of a jelly or jam. Luxury ones might have chopped nuts and maybe even uh, glacé cherries. The meaty version sounds fun. So um, the main brand in the US for mincemeat, like on, a, on grocery shelves, is, it's the brand Nunsuch. I may have some advertisements for it in here, I'm not sure, because um, it's a relatively old brand. Um, but the, the US version, it still has beef suet. I've not seen a veggie version of it. Um, I, it has raisins and spices and sugar. Um, and generally has nuts and apples in it. I don't know that I've seen cherries in it or um, 
But yeah, it is kind of similar to like a chunky jam or a chunky jelly. And then when I use it, I get some fresh Granny Smith apples and cut them up and mix them in it and let it sit uh, at least for 48 hours. So I mix the prepared mincemeat with the fresh apples for 48 hours and then I use that to make a pie with um, because it gives it a little bit more body and crunch from the apples. Um, but typically uh, a fresh mincemeat, most mincemeat recipes called for letting it ferment for a year. <laughs> so, um, okay, this first item that I have here, this is cut from the um, James Bernard Jones collection, or this is technically the second item, I suppose. Let me pull up uh, some information on this collection, just so I can tell you who this person was before we look at this menu. Um, everything is updated and all of my windows look funny because <laughs> I've updated the software. <laughs> uh, James Bernard Jones. Okay, so this collection is called The James Bernard Jones Memorabilia, 1913 to 1922. Um, James Bernard Jones lived in Gordonsville, Virginia, prior to attending VPI, Virginia Polytechnic Institute, which is an older name for Virginia Tech. Um, he was a student from 1917 to 1921 and was one of the youngest of his class. He graduated in 1921 with a degree in mechanical engineering. While at VPI, he was involved in the tennis and racket clubs and in the Lee Literary Society, among other activities. Senior photographs of James Bernard Jones are available online. Um, additional group photos, let's see. The collection contains several pieces of ephemera related to VPI, a pamphlet on the programs of study available, a Thanksgiving menu, and a commencement program. So the one that we're gonna be looking at today is the Thanksgiving menu, because why not? <laughs> we have a number of them. So here we go. Uh, let me scooch that down just a little bit so that you all can see the top and the bottom. So this is a Thanksgiving dinner menu from Virginia Polytechnic Institute from 1917. Um, today, basically all the students go home for Thanksgiving. Um, the university is, is basically vacated. Everybody goes home, uh, except for international students. And international students, there will be typical U.S. Thanksgiving fair served in the dining hall here, um, as well as like most of the typical options of the, there's a good variety of food in the dining halls here. But also there are groups around town that will invite international students over to experience a, a Thanksgiving dinner. Some of the churches, their members invite people um, trying to, so it, Thanksgiving is seen in the U.S. as a time to gather and to give thanks for um, the good things in your life from the past year. So knowing that there are people who can't travel home to family because if they left the country, they would have a difficult time coming back into the country. Even though they're not from the U.S., it's a very American thing to do to invite them over for the meal. <clears throat> So that is, that is a thing. But in 1917, the university had, and, and actually like <clears throat> the early years of the university, they had uh, a Thanksgiving meal that was served on campus. Um, so the menu from 1917 includes uh, bleached celery, sweet mixed pickle, and saltine crackers, <clears throat> roast native turkey, oyster dressing and cranberry sauce, mashed potatoes, green peas, baked country ham, brown sweet potatoes, asparagus vinaigrette, homemade mince meat pie, plum pudding, and hard, uh, <clears throat> hard sauce. I'm not certain whether the hard sauce is a separate thing or part of the plum pudding. I've never actually had a plum pudding, so I don't 
actually know what it is, and this comma here could either be separating two separate items or be saying that the plum pudding is served with hard sauces. If anybody knows uh, what plum pudding is like or what a hard sauce would be in this context, I would love to know. And then they had bananas, oranges, grapes, apples, and coffee. <clears throat> It would have gone with the pudding. Thank you, Kira. Um, I suspected that was the case. It's just that up here they had the roast turkey with and oyster dressing. Ah, uh, no, that's a comma and they would have gone together too because the dressing, oyster dressing would be like stuffing, but dressing is what you, so the difference between stuffing and dressing terminologically is whether you put it, whether you cook it inside the bird or outside the bird. <laughs> so, yeah. That is surprisingly not very different than a traditional, um, what you would expect for a traditional Thanksgiving meal today. Um, Honestly, I grew up having a, a pickle tray before the meal because uh, typically Thanksgiving meal, and, and this is gonna vary by family. Like the traditions are all gonna be very personal. In my family, um, the Thanksgiving meal happened around one or 2 p.m. Uh, so 1300 or 1400 um, is, is when the meal would occur because cooking was happening all day up until then. And it really depended on when the bird was done. That was when the meal happened. Uh, so it was early, typically early afternoon. Um, and we weren't allowed into the kitchen to get breakfast. And we're discouraged from eating breakfast because we were going to have a large meal later. So there would be a pickle tray. Uh, and it was generally some celery or um, uh, a dish for kids in the U.S. called Ants on the Log, uh, which is short little like maybe two inch long pieces of celery with peanut butter inside and raisins um, stuck into the peanut butter and and pickles a variety of pickles <laughs> um, hard sauce is a sauce that often gets put on puddings or similar baked desserts it generally contains alcohol and can be lit on fire uh, now i see why it's called hard sauce because alcohol the cookie plate is also important. <laughs> yes, key squared, the cookie plate would be. I don't see a cookie plate here, though. They just have the mince pie and the pudding. And then fruit. But, but yeah, growing up for me, it, it was a pickle tray to snack on so that we weren't hungry all day, uh, but didn't spoil our appetite for later. Just here for coffee. Kira beat you to it. A reference to something like the brandy sauce we have as it uses, yes. Basically a roux, but with booze. And it goes on the Christmas pudding, which was previously plum pudding, aka also known as plum duff. I didn't realize plum duff and plum pudding were the same thing. Uh, a very heavy fruit sponge, steamed rather than baked. See, there is so much to learn. I, I know some things, but there's a lot that I don't know. And I love this show because I always learn something. Um, so that was one menu. Now I have a folder called Menus. 1922 to 1925. Um, and this is from a different collection. So I'm gonna look up the collection. Um, MS 1970-005. So this is from the James P. King collection. Uh, James Peter King, the son of Dr. John C. and Fanny Price King, was born in Virginia in 1902. In the early 20th century, the younger King moved with his family from Marion, Virginia to Radford, where his father established St. Albans Psychiatric Hospital. As a student at Tech, uh, Jimmy King was a member of the Coalition, or sorry, the Cotillion Club, 
and worked as circulation manager and associate manager of the school newspaper, then known as the Virginia Tech. He also served as a football manager, class secretary, and on the ring committee. In his senior year, King served as, a, as business manager for the 1926 Bugle, which is the yearbook. Um, he went on to medical school and later became the medical director of the psychiatric hospital that his father established. So yeah, um, and what we have here are gonna be some menus, some Thanksgiving menus. The school wouldn't have had cookies, too hard to produce in quantity for an event like this. Rarely, if at all, see cookies in at historical campus meals. Interesting. Yeah, now cookies are everywhere now. <laughs> Not to be confused with figgy duff, which either has more raisins or more guitars. Figgy star duff. <laughs> Just here for coffee uh, points for that. Figgy star duff. Um, let's see. We don't want the Cotillion Club banquet. That's not the menu we're after. Um, initial banquet, monogram club. All right, we have two more Thanksgiving menus here. They look on the front, like the cover of them, um, they look very similar to the one that we just looked at. So the one we just looked at was 1917. This is 1922 and 1924. <clears throat> so very similar. The first one, 1922, titled Thanksgiving Dinner, VPI Dining Hall, December 3rd, 1922. So December 3rd is when this happened, after the actual Thanksgiving holiday. Because the Thanksg Thanksgiving holiday is the third Thursday in November is when it happens. Right? <laughs> Hi, Hannah. My brain now says, are you sure about that? Yeah, it's the third Thursday in November. Um, so, a little bit more information in this menu. Fourth Thursday, thank you, Karen. I knew third sounded too early, but my brain also was just like, all right, I said it, I'm gonna stick with it. <laughs> Fourth Thursday in November, thank you, Karen. Um, so we get a little bit of information here. The Corps of Cadets, so Virginia Tech is a uh, m military institute at this period in time. Um, I mean, we still have yeah, if it was the third, it would be tomorrow. Uh, we still have a Corps of Cadets at Virginia Tech. Um, a significantly larger percentage of the student body. <laughs> In fact, let me see, 1922, probably 100% of the student body were members of the Corps at that time. I can't remember exactly when it started to shift to have non-Corps non, non -Corps of Cadets. My brain has had so much information in it that that detail is just not coming to the fore. Uh, but so we have the core officers, uh, the president, second, or president, two vice presidents, secretary, treasurer, sergeant at arms, defending attorney and prosecuting attorney, and cheerleader. Apparently those are the officers of the core. First women students and a few exceptions to the core in 1922. So this would have been the first year. And I was thinking it was sometime around then, I just couldn't remember the year, so I was, wasn't gonna commit on that after having been wrong about which Thursday Thanksgiving was. Uh, wasn't mandated nationally as the fourth Thursday until 1966. I didn't know that. That's cool. Um, this Thanksgiving meal had music provided by the VPI Big Six Orchestra. And this is actually the first time that I have heard of the Big Six Orchestra. I'm aware of a couple of different musical groups throughout Virginia Tech's history. I didn't, I don't think I've heard of the Big Six Orchestra before. So now I'm curious and I'll, I'll want to look into that. 
And then we have the steward. Thanksgiving history is very complicated. Um, so on the menu though, the actual meals, we still have mixed sweet pickles and bleached celery. But this year we have green olives instead of, what was it on the last menu? Um, see now I'm, I'm looking. Saltine crackers. So no saltine crackers this time. The salty item is the green olives this time. A roast turkey with dressing and cranberry sauce. Uh, previously it was roast turkey with oyster dressing. Uh, mashed potatoes, gl glazed sweet potatoes, and green peas. Uh, they've added the sweet potatoes. Olives are very good, yeah. Harlequin ice cream. I don't know what harlequin ice cream would be. Uh, would that just be like a swirl ice cream? I'm Neapolitan. Okay, so if you're not familiar with the terminology Harlequin ice cream or you're not familiar with Neapolitan ice cream, um, Neapolitan is what it is called today. Um, and that is basically just a, a, it's chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry together. Um, typically it's served, it comes in a container where there's stripes of chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry. Um, I didn't, I did not know that that was called Harlequin ice cream as well. Uh, lady fingers, vanilla wafers, grape juice punch, grapes, layer raisins, and mixed nuts. I, another new thing that I've never heard of before. What are layer raisins? Does anybody know what layer raisins are? <laughs> you used to love Neapolitan? Yeah, I still like Le Neapolitan. Harlequin may also contain a layer of pistachio. Ah, see now I definitely need Harlequin ice cream. I, I actually quite like pistachio ice cream, so. Um, although, yeah, I, I don't need to go into that. I was gonna say, typically I would prefer that the ice cream to not have chunks of nuts in it, but. Um, <laughs> yeah, I need some Harlequin ice cream. <laughs> I like the nom emote. My chat is like super tiny. I'm having to lean in. I'm gonna see if I can make you all bigger. Um, yeah, that makes it so much easier to read. I'm gonna be annoyed by the size later, but... Uh, okay, so two years later, two years later, it is now called the annual Thanksgiving dinner, VPI Dining Hall, Sunday, November 30th, November, uh, 1924. Not ice cream that chases down the Joker with a giant mallet. <laughs> um, we still get the list of core officers. The music this year, two years later, is by the College Orchestra. So not the Big Six Orchestra this year, just the College Orchestra. Uh, we only have two of like the appetizer position, the um, bleached celery and sweet mixed pickles. We've lost the olives and the, sal the saltines. Uh, we have roast Virginia raised turkey and dressing, giblet gravy and cranberry sauce, creamed potatoes, green peas, finger rolls and creamery butter. I'm curious. Oh, layer raisins just refers to quality and packaging storing. Higher in quality, left in bunches, and packaged between paper. Interesting. So, seeing creamery butter listed on here, I'm wondering if the Virginia Tech creamery was new or in operation at the time, and if this is meaning that it is butter from the university creamery or not. It was in operation. So that would be my guess, that this is specifically butter from the university's creamery. Because um, as an agricultural school, it wouldn't have been new. So, it, I mean, it's the first time butter has shown up on the menu, and to call it out as creamery butter, I'm just, I would wonder, my, my guess would be that this is specifically butter from the creamery, but I, I couldn't be certain. But that would be my guess. <laughs> um, 
Harlequin blocked ice cream, ladyfingers, and kisses. Uh, Grimes golden apples and grapes and mixed nuts and fruit punch. I am not familiar with the Grimes golden apple, but um, there have been a lot of apple varieties over the years, so that's not terribly surprising. So some consistency in general makeup of the menu, but also like some variation every year, it seems. Um, these two also had photographs on the back of the football team. So dedicated to our big football team, winners of the 1922 championship with a photo of the football team. And then 1924 just says dedicated to our team. <laughs> It's a historical cultivar from Virginia. Awesome, Key Squared. Hi, Galara Dragon. Are those apples? Is that an apple emote? No, cranberries. We're, we're gonna get to cranberries in a minute. Harlequin ice cream and Neapolitan ice cream are this, you can confirm. Okay, I had not heard of Harlequin before. But yeah, so 1924 football team there on the back of this menu. with the, the 1922 championship football team here on the back of the, the other menu. I don't know when football was first associated with Thanksgiving in the United States, but it most definitely has an association today. Um, and apparently in the 1920s, it had an association because they were putting it on the menu. Uh, <laughs> let's see. See what other menus can I find here? Also, I should look at the time and confirm. Right. Okay. <laughs> I have a computer that actually is showing me the proper time today. Oh, your other name is Cranberry. I did not know that. Uh, that's cool. I, I have some cranberry stuff that we're going to be looking at here soon. Uh, I just, I have a couple more menus I wanted to look at first. Uh, menus, menus, menus. Okay. I have three more folders here that I for sure have menus in them. So we'll look at those next. These are not Virginia Tech menus, however. These are gonna be war menus. So this first folder is from the Military and Wartime Cookery Collection. Uh, World War I menus, 1918 to 1919. So let's see. Remember all the happy times we This was, that's April, so not Thanksgiving. This is the Thanksgiving one. World War I, Thanksgiving dinner men menu, dinner, Thanksgiving day. I can zoom in a little bit, I think. Let me position this properly for y'all. Uh, All right, I'll tell you the truth. I don't know how easily you can see it, but let's see. Oh, we have a definition. The actual definition for Harlequin ice cream says it's a layered ice cream with three flavors, but the flavors have varied over the years. Historically, it was the color of the Italian flag with green, pistachio or almond, <clears throat> white, vanilla, and red, cherry, that was actually pink. Interesting. Okay. That's cool. Uh, so yeah, we will definitely be looking at cranberry stuff. <laughs> um, okay, so this menu is roughly contemporaneous with the first menu that we looked at. That one was 1917. This is 1918. 
uh, dinner, Thanksgiving Day. Um, it seems a bit washed out. I wonder if I turn this light off. Does it help at all? I think, I think that's better. Dinner, Thanksgiving Day, United States Naval Air Base, Eastley, England, 28 November, 1918. So this is a menu for U.S. Thanksgiving on an airbase in England during World War I. And we have the cruise menu. And once again, sweet pickles! <laughs> I didn't pull anything specifically on sweet pickles, but apparently it was not just my family that had sweet pickles every Thanksgiving. They seem to be, uh, at least in military life, uh, the Corps of Cadets and, and this airbase, sweet pickles. Um, roast young turkey, giblet gravy, sage dressing, mashed potatoes, buttered asparagus, French peas, a vegetable salad, mayonnaise dressing, pumpkin pie, marble cake, cheese, oranges, apples, mixed nuts, cigars and cigarettes, and café noir, which would be black coffee. <laughs> um, uh, Galara, this is all from the collections here. Um, so I'm, I'm streaming from the Special Collections and University Archives at Virginia Tech. Um, so this is this is where I work as an archivist here, and this is all from our collections at the the archives here. French peas equals peas, onions, and mushrooms, at least according to the recipe that you found. Um, it may also just be the specific type of pea plant itself. I don't know if it's referring to a dish or just to to the peas. Um, but that is good to know that it is, uh, that there is a dish called French peas, which is peas, onions, and mushrooms. <laughs> yeah, mayonnaise dressing. The cigars and cigarettes, I mean, it was wartime. It was 1918. Cigars, cigarettes, and black coffees seem like they would be a fairly common way to end a meal. <laughs> uh, we have a couple more of these military menus that, um, but interestingly, this menu, the format of this menu, um, cause here on the back, we actually have the United States Naval Aviation Repair Base, Eastley, England, um, Commander B.T. Bumler, uh, sorry, B.T. Bulmer, U.S. Navy Commanding, Lieutenant J.F. Dunn, U.S. Navy I'm not sure what RF means there. Executive Officer, uh, Lieutenant J.G. Ventner, or, or Venter, Supply Officer, Pay Clerk, uh, Charles J. Wacker, uh, Commissary Officer, uh, Chief Commissary Steward, B. Meyer, U.S. Navy Steward. Um, so just the, the format, the format of the menu You've got the title page, you've got the list of officers, and you've got the menu itself. Very similar between the university menu and the, um, the military menu. Um, mayonnaise is misspelled based on the way that it is typically spelled today. Um, English has had varied spellings over the years, and I would have to do research to determine whether this is indeed a misspelling or whether this is just how mayonnaise was commonly spelled in the early 19-teens. Um, so, I don't know, but yeah. Uh, thank you, Just Here for Coffee. Reserve Fleet would be what the RF means there. So I, I find it really interesting how similar the Virginia Tech menus and the Navy base menu ended up being as far as like what was served, but also the way the menu was presented. They were very similar. 
Uh, the next folder I have is also from the Military and Wartime Cookery Collection. This is from between the wars, so 1920 to 1938 time range. There are menus in here from 1924 and 1935. Um, which ones are Thanksgiving? I don't know. We have a Thanksgiving day and a Christmas day. Um, yeah, it's possible that they could have spelled it differently than I don't know though. All right, this one is framed. So we'll see how well this comes across on stream. Uh, it doesn't seem like we're getting too much glare. So um, this is the Thanksgiving day menu. It is framed for hanging. Um, this is, again, between the wars, between World War I and World War II. So this is November 27th, 1924, Thanksgiving Day, 28th Bombardment Squadron, Mess, Camp Nichols, P1. Um, that's all it's giving me on location. I don't know where the 28th Bombardment Squadron was stationed. I don't know where Camp Nichols is Camp Nichols P I? I'm gonna do a quick Google. Uh huh. I found one result that came up with. That exact name, General Mitchell, General Aguinaldo, ready for flight, Camp Nichols P.I. I don't know where P.I. is. I don't know what it's an abbreviation for. Non-acid free paper. Um, honestly, this is a, this is a professional framing job. I suspect it might actually be acid free. Um, does anybody know what the abbreviation PI means for location? Oh, Philippine Islands. Is... Yep. All right, so this is from the Philippines. I had not seen the abbreviation PI before. Yeah, it, it is out of date abbreviation for the Philippines. Um, could be acid free mat matting. Yeah, I, I'm not sure, Galara Dragon. Um, I don't know when it was framed, but yeah. Um, but yes, so Camp Nichols is, is an airfield, Nichols Field um, in the Philippines. So that is where this menu is from. And we have the meal divided into different courses. We have soup, meats, vegetables, pies, cakes, uh, nuts and fruits, and then uh, the rest after that. So we've got uh, for soup, cream of tomatoes and crackers. <laughs> You're a framer. And you use the blue acid-free paper now. Brown, brown usually means acid. Yeah, I don't know. I, because I know this was done at uh, Merwin's Art Shop in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, and it's in really good condition. Uh, and we store it in acid-free folders here, but I don't, uh, that doesn't help if it's acidic on the inside. Uh, for meats, they have roast turkey and roast loin pork, uh, fruit dressing and applesauce, cold sliced ham, uh, Interesting, the spelling used here. It is Swift's cheese, S-W-I-F-T-S, cheese. I had to double check looking at it to make sure it wasn't um, trying to say Swiss cheese and just doing like the little um, 
I forget what the name of the character is, but the, the long S that is shaped the way that we expect an F to be shaped. Um, Swift's cheese, I'm not certain what that is, uh, or whether that is just a misspelling of Swiss. Um, there don't tend to be too many tomato products at Thanksgiving these days, that's true. There was a Camp Nichols in Oklahoma established in May of 1865 and abandoned. Yeah, in the menu it's PI, so it's definitely the Philippines. Uh, but yeah, interesting that there was another Camp Nichols. Yeah, cheese, not a, not a big association. And this is a much more diverse and large menu than the previous ones that we've looked at. Um, green olives, tomato ketchup, sour pickles and fruit salad. Um, vegetables, they have mashed potatoes, candied sweet potatoes, creamed asparagus tips, cranberry sauce, giblet gravy. Uh, for pies, they have blackberry and chocolate pies. Uh, cakes, they have a coconut layer cake and a marble cake. And then um, under bread, jelly rolls and butter, I guess there is no subsection there. They have bread, jelly rolls, butter, nuts and fruits, uh, including oranges, apples, bananas, mixed nuts, and assorted candy. They also have cigars and cigarettes. Ice cold lemonade. <laughs> Olives, very much uh, associated with the holiday for a lot of us. Um, they list the cooks. The dining room orderly, the squadron commander, the mess officer, the mess sergeant. So a different presentation to the menu and also a different menu. Um, I have a Christmas dinner menu here, but I think we're looking at some Christmas stuff later into December. So I'm going to stick with Thanksgiving for now. We might. Um, when we get to the end of stream, if we want to, we can look at some of the Christmas stuff because we'll, we'll be like the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade and bring out Santa Claus at the end. <laughs> so lastly, I have another folder here from the Military and Wartime Cookery Collection. Uh, lastly for menus, I should say. This is World War II menus, uh, 1942 to 1945 date range. Um, so let's see what we have. I know there's at least one Thanksgiving menu in here. This... is from November. I don't know that it is Thanksgiving. We will possibly look at that one. Uh, this one... Oh, that's a hotel menu. Independence Day dinner. Emergency menus. Army insignia rank. The corner. Thanksgiving Day menu. This is the, <laughs> the reason that I pulled this one. All right. Thanksgiving Day menu. Uh, let's see. Oh, it's on photo paper. Oh. <laughs> um. HQ and HQ Company, 124th SIGBN. I don't, I don't know what all these abbreviations mean. I'm sorry, I'm just not an expert on uh, exactly what that would be. This is from Fort Lewis, Washington. And you can see there are some black and white photographs that are the reason why the cover of this menu is on photo paper. Uh, which is also why I'm now wearing white gloves. Um, 
because rather than just being on paper where the gloves are not the greatest thing to use, um, this is photo paper and I don't want to mess it up with the oils from my hands. Uh, but I'll zoom in as best I can on some of these photographs and we can look at them. So that looks to me like, like they're setting up a tent. And here we've got three soldiers in their little hard helmets there. Um, they appear to be eating. I'm guessing these are mess photos specifically. Mess, if you're unfamiliar with uh, military terminology, being um, the division or the area of serving food. Like the mess hall is where food is served. Um, got another photo here of they're outside a tent there. It looks like they're just tightening the um, lines on that tent. So still s s tent set up there. Uh, here we've got some soldiers. Looks like large barrels. Kind of look like trash cans, but uh, I'm uncertain. They, they look like they're in line to get food or something. I'm not certain exactly what's going on in that photograph. I don't know the origin of, of the terminology mess for where, where food is served. If somebody does know that, um, feel free to drop that in chat because that would be an interesting thing to learn. Some people here having some camaraderie. This to me, this last one looks like they're taking down a tent now. Um, old French uh, mess, M-E-S, portion of food. So I, that seems like a, probably a good reason as to why. Okay, so now, now I'm gonna have one hand gloved and one not because my left hand is still holding the photo paper. Uh, my right hand, however, <laughs> is gonna be working with actual paper. Um, all right, I'll just zoom out a little bit. And we'll take a look at this menu here. Um, you know, I can zoom to the page level for you all, and so you can get a full, a full look at this with the illustration. Also, this has staples in it, um, and I'm uncertain as to the exact thought process when this, this was being processed about leaving them in, uh, whether it was felt that it would cause more damage to remove them, um, or whether it was just a matter of more product, less process, which is a philosophy in archives, meaning uh, it's better to get stuff described than to get bogged down in the details of removing every staple and paperclip. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, the, the staples are starting to rust a little bit and will eventually damage the paper, uh, but anyway. Uh, so we've got the illustration there. I, this is, I don't know the specific date. I do know it is from World War II, according to the uh, collection that it's in. Um, but the menu here, slightly different than what we have seen before. We start with shrimp cocktail or fresh fruit cup with crackers. I don't know that I've ever had a fruit cup with crackers. But those, those are the starters. Then we have roast turkey with giblet gravy or baked Virginia ham with pineapple sauce and bread dressing. So bread dressing, again, that's just stuffing. Um, 
ham with pineapple, very much association of ham with pineapple. Uh, mid 1940s definitely hits. Um, I don't know, I haven't researched exactly when that association started, but it is very much a part of US perceptions by the mid 1940s for sure. Uh, cranberry sauce, mashed potatoes, candied sweet potatoes, uh, buttered green peas, buttered golden corn. This is the first time that corn has been on any of these menus. Uh, assorted crisp relishes, olives and pickles, assorted hot rolls, butter, pumpkin pie or mincemeat pie with whipping cream, fruit cake, associated fresh fruits, candy and nuts, milk, tea, and coffee. This one does not have cigars and cigarettes. Yes, this definitely was done with a typewriter and, and the art would have been done um, by hand most likely with the aid of a ruler, but yeah, this was, this was done by hand. It does look, it almost looks like something you would expect in like 1980s and to have been run off on like a, a Xerox machine. Um, but yeah, this is the mid 1940s. So I would say we've, we've definitely come across like every single thing that you can possibly think of as a traditional Thanksgiving meal item uh, through these menus now. Um, well, maybe not everything that you could have, th but most of like the traditional assumptions, the pumpkin pie, the mincemeat pie, uh, the pickles, the turkey, the ham, the mashed potatoes, the sweet potatoes, um, corn, peas, did not see green bean casserole. None of those menus had green bean casserole on them, which I would say is a pretty common one. Um, I don't think so, key squared. Uh, it doesn't seem like a mimeograph machine. I, I'm not certain how they would have gone about duplication uh, for that, but the Typically mimeographs uh, or like the, the spirit duplicators end up with like a purplish ink um, and they tend to, the duplication tends to be a bit more washed out and have less fine lines. Um, so that, that's my reasoning for thinking probably not, but I can't say for sure. All right, where was I? Pamphlet collection, that's what I want. All right, how about we look at some cranberry stuff? Green bean casserole actually wasn't invented until the 1950s. Interesting, yes, I remember the purple, purple ink from school as well. It did indeed smell really good. Um. <laughs> so this is gonna be from the culinary pamphlet collection, uh, which is a collection of culinary pamphlets. Amazing. Um, oh, hi, Scraff. I'm doing good. How are you today? We are looking at material related to the U.S. holiday Thanksgiving. I don't know where you're located, and I do know we have international viewers, so I'm referring to it as the U.S. holiday Thanksgiving and explaining some of the Thanksgiving traditions as we go, uh, just in case there are people watching who aren't familiar with uh, what American Thanksgiving traditions look like. Plus, American Thanksgiving traditions vary by person and region of the country, so... Um, we have uh, some cranberry items here. This one... is from the National Cranberry Association, which I believe, if I am recalling correctly from the finding aid, became Ocean Spray? If I'm wrong on that, please correct me, Kira. Um, I'm also just gonna find the collection so that I have 
Nope. Culinary pamphlet collection. Cranberry. Eight occurrences. American Cranberry Exchange, that's not one. National Cranberry Association, later Ocean Spray Cranberry Incorporated, also Cranberry Canners Incorporated. <laughs> um, oh, I have more. I, I, I just have what was already in the collection. Kira did tell me um, yesterday that we just got some new cranberry pamphlets in, uh, but yeah. Um, Thanksgiving is the fourth Thursday of November. So it would be next week on Thursday in, uh, for this year. Um, and we will not be having a stream next week because the library closes at noon and they lock the building. So I actually can't be in the building next week at this time. Um, so Ocean Spray Cranberries uh, from the National Cranberry Association. This appears to be from 1941. Cape Cod's Ocean Spray Cranberry Kitchen. This book is not so much a cookbook as it is a serve book. We've done the cooking and made you a cranberry sauce that's ready to serve. Now this book suggests a variety of attractive ways to use Ocean Spray Cranberry Sauce and Cranberry Juice Cocktail. In serving cranberry sauce, perhaps you've been accustomed to just opening a can, slicing the sauce, and serving it with meat. That's still a good way to serve it, and an easy way. But there are so many other things you can do with Ocean Spray Cranberry Sauce. Use it to make leftovers go further. Use it to add color and flavor to salads. Use it in mouth-watering desserts. We show you how in the following pages. Every recipe in this book has been tested in our cranberry kitchen and rechecked in good, housekeep good housekeeping kitchens. Only those recipes which our tasting board voted unusually good have been used. To everyone who likes cranberries, we say, here's to good eating and greater enjoyment of Ocean Spray Cranberry Sauce and Cranberry Juice Cocktail. Cordially, the folks at the Cranberry Kitchen. Copyright 1941, Cranberry Canners Incorporated, Hanson, Massachusetts. <laughs> Our pamphlet collection has a hundred uh, has hundreds of items. Yes, yes, we do have. <laughs> they they do, <laughs> they do love cranberries a lot. <laughs> but this is this is the National Cranberry Association, so that should be expected. Um, let's see. So we get some recipes: uh, bouquet cocktail, bananas in cranberry juice. That one sounds unusual. You can make this in a jiffy and no need to worry about the bananas turning dark. Cranberry juice preserves their color. Place sliced bananas in individual dishes or sherbet glasses. Pour chilled ocean spray cranberry juice cocktail over sliced bananas. Serve for breakfast or as a first course. I have never heard of that, but okay. Wreath appetizers, cranberry banana toast, cranberry omelet. Cranberry omelet? Dad and the youngsters will come a running when there's cranberry omelet for breakfast. Separate yolks from whites of four eggs. To yolks, add half a teaspoon of salt, few grains of pepper, and four tablespoons hot milk or hot water. Beat until thick and lemon colored. Beat whites until stiff, cutting and folding them into first mixture until well blended. Heat omelet pan, butter sides and bottom, turn in mixture, spread evenly. Place over heat where it will cook slowly, occasionally turning pan to brown omelet evenly. When well puffed and delicately browned underneath, place pan on center grate of oven to finish cooking on top. The omelet is cooked if it is firm to the touch when pressed by the finger. Cover with slices of Ocean Spray jellied cranberry sauce or with Ocean Spray whole fruit cranberry sauce. Fold and serve. So it's an omelet that you then just add the cranberry jelly to. 
and I still can't imagine what that would taste like. <laughs> that is a, I would never have thought to put cranberries with eggs. I don't know why, it goes well with turkey. So it would, should go well with chicken and chicken and egg, it's just never an application that I had thought of. Cranberry grapefruit salad, molded cabbage, cranberry salad, oh, molded. It's, it's jelly recipes, jello molds, not like moldy as in getting old and growing mold. Cranberry avocado salad. Jellied cranberry orange salad, jiffy chicken cranberry salads, cranberry pineapple relish. So this is just, and a lot of these pamphlets are, the companies that produce these foods put out guides full of recipes of how to use their foods and how to use their products. Um, and so this one just happens to be cranberry focused because it's the National Cranberry Association. Um, Here's a lovely picture with a turkey. Cranberry sauce adds color and flavor to the festive board. You get New Year, Valentine's, Easter, 4th of July, Halloween, Christmas, but central you have Thanksgiving. Ocean spray jellied cranberry sauce cut in turkey shapes will steal the limelight of your Thanksgiving table. See page 31 for turkey cutter offer. You can make so many attractive garnishes with Ocean Spray Jellied Cranberry Sauce. It's colorful and adds a gay note to your table. It has a zestful, tart flavor that makes it an excellent accompaniment for any number of foods. It's firmly molded and can be cut in attractive shapes suggestive of the season. The next time you're entertaining, try one of, uh, try one of the suggestions on this page to give your food a festive air. And they've got, uh, down here in the corner, cranberry jelly cut into little turkey shapes. <laughs> Key squared, yeah. Um, this, is, this is into the 40s and they're still using gay to mean um, happy uh, rather than the, the modern understanding of the word. And they've cut the jelly into stars on this page. Scarlet Sinners, meats and fish. Sauce with a star-shaped, oh, no, that's finishing up star-spangled meat platter. Scarlet Sinners, nothing sinful about this dish except the quantities everyone will put away. Down on Cape Cod, cranberry sauce is a favorite with fish. codfish and potato dish served with cranberry. I'm not going to give away all the recipes. Yes! A lot of work to cut out those tur little turkey jigglers. Cranburgers, Chatham Special, Cape Cod Sandwich, Frankfurters with cranberry and horseradish sauce. Cranberry molasses cookies, cranberry popsicles, cranberry blossoms, cranberry banana tarts, they literally had basically a test kitchen of people go through and develop as many recipes as possible incorporating cranberries. Although this book appears to basically only have um, stuff for the cranberry jelly application. I haven't run across any of like the actual like cranberry sauce rather than the jelly stuff that comes in the can. Cranburgers, yes, I, I, I can read that one if we want. Slip a thin slice of jellied cranberry sauce into hamburger patties, or sorry, let me try that again. Slip a thin slice of jellied cranberry sauce into hamburg patties. 
adds snappy flavor. Broil hamburg patties, place on half of a toasted roll, top with a slice of ocean spray jellied cranberry sauce, and place remaining half of toasted roll on top. I love that it gives you instruction on how to assemble a hamburger. And that, that you have to put the, first you put the patty on the toasted bun, then you put the cranberry sauce on top, and then you put the other half of the bun on top. I just, I, <laughs> I, I feel like it might get melty and fall out, yeah. You made a pear cranberry frangipan tart from scratch last year. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, like they just like take a slice of our cranberry jelly and put it on top of a hamburger. You don't want to do it in the wrong order. It gets messy faster. Um, uh, but I could definitely see like tart flavors on a hamburger or a cheeseburger. They do work well. Um, one of my favorite combinations is to take um, a cheeseburger and put a slice of pineapple on it uh, with some teriyaki sauce, and it's amazing. Um, although I think I've only ever done that with a turkey burger, so I don't know what it's like with a beef burger. Um, Let's see, let's see what else we got. Oh, and there's the offer for the cutters. Gotta end with an advertisement, right? End the, the little booklet with an advertisement. <laughs> Easier without the bun. Yeah, Shiny Marigold, I do think you are probably correct. To add a sprightly touch to festive meals, cut ocean spray jellied cranberry sauce in fancy shapes. Easy to do with these gay plastic cutters designed exclusively for ocean spray. Serve Thanksgiving cranberry sauce cut into the shape of turkeys. Christmas cranberry sauce cut into star-topped Christmas trees. And Easter cranberry sauce served in the shape of plump little bunnies. To get your set of these individual cutters, just send 10 cents and one ocean spray label for any one cutter or three labels and 25 cents for all three cutters. To Ocean Spray, Department CB, Hanson, Massachusetts. These plastic cutters are original designs for Ocean Spray and cannot be duplicated. <laughs> you, cut your, your, you cut your plastic gaily. Um, and yeah, that is not a bad price, 10 cents uh, 25 cents for all three, plus having had to have purchased their product in order to get the, the labels, um, and then postage to send the, to send the coins and the labels in, but you don't have to pay postage on the shipping of the actual plastic cutters themselves. So that's our first cranberry uh, pamphlet. Let's see what else we have here. Uh, 101 all-time favorite cranberry recipes, again, from the National Cranberry Association. Uh, this, this booklet costs 25 cents. Um, I'm not certain of the year. You can see the um, Pilgrim and indigenous person illustrations that were fairly common of the time. Uh, the art style is cute. The um, depictions of indigenous people here are definitely very stereotypical and so I'm less enamored of them, but the art style is quite cute. I don't see a year on this. <laughs> I have to call it out, though, because it's my stream, so I, I, I have to make sure that it gets mentioned. We, I can't just say it's cute and leave it at that. Uh, <laughs> you're surprised you, there isn't a recipe for how you can fill in the cutout circles mayo with mayo or cream cheese. Um, yeah. Oh, dear. 
No, Kira, you're giving me ideas. You're, you're, you're giving me ideas for future streams where I subject them all to frosted sandwiches. Um, oh, there's some stuff about the berries. Yes, Kira, we're going to have to do frosted sandwiches. <laughs> the beginning of the berries. I don't know why my angles are so off with this camera today. Cranberries are truly North American berries. Before Columbus came to the New World, the tangy wild cranberries had an important place for everyday life here. Uh, indigenous women used cranberries to brighten up food. I am uh, adjusting the terminology a little bit. You can see what the actual words printed in the pamphlet are by looking at your screen. Uh, I can zoom in a little bit for you if you need me to. Just let me know. Uh, everyone must learn of the frosted sandwich. Pakinkin, Pakinkinson meant cranberry eater. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I end up just reading key squared, but uh, I'm trying to be mindful and, and make the adjustments where possible. Um, I'm sight reading this stuff. I've never read it before, so sometimes I miss it, but, uh... Also an option, just think of what you could do with some food coloring or chunks of fruit or gelatin. Oh dear, we'll need to do an entire month on gelatin. Um, the Wampanoag uh, people of Cape Cod area treated wounds from poisoned arrows with a cranberry dressing. Uh, women made their rugs and blankets colorful with the red cranberry juice. Pilgrim women learned of this wild berry from the friendly indigenous people. They soon began to create their own ways of fixing cranberries for their tables. They made cranberry sauces, bubbling tarts, and nogs. Yes, aspic. Oh, just here for coffee. The 50s know nothing on the 70s. <laughs> uh, the naming of the berries. Cranberries were called different names by different indigenous peoples. Uh, Sasamanish by Eastern in Indians and uh, Atakwa by the Algonquins in Wisconsin. In New Jersey, where cranberries were the symbol of peace, uh, Pakiminsen meant cranberry eater. You were reading from the book. That's where, okay. Yes, Kira. Uh, I don't know exactly when we'll do that, but... Oh no. Oh dear. Oh no. Oh no, oh no. I'm sorry. The, um... I'm not going to read the illustration, but you can probably see what it says. And it's a bit problematic, just given the, um... If you ever watched early westerns, uh, there was a certain stereotypical way that they made indigenous people speak, uh, often not played by indigenous people, um, uh, that is quite derogatory and um, shows up here. The word cranberry was a contraction of crane berry, an early name given to the berries because their pale pink blossoms resembled the head, resembled the head of a crane. Cranes were seen in the lowlands, enjoying the berries. Cultivation began in Massachusetts nearly 200 years after the landing of the Pilgrims. In 1816, Henry Hall of Dennis, Cape Cod, noticed that cranberries seemed to grow larger and juicier where sand from the dunes blew over the vines. Cultivation today came from this simple observation made nearly 150 years ago. Cranberries grow on peat soil that has been covered with a three-inch layer of sand. Cuttings or branches from existing cranberry vines are planted deep enough to take root in the peat soil beneath the sand. The vines, planted about six inches apart, gradually spread over the ground, forming a thick green carpet. The vines are weeded in the spring, pruned in the fall, fertilized, and resanded every three or four years. Vines are protected from frost by flooding and irrigated in time of drought. <clears throat> Interesting. So I like that it actually gives a little bit of the history of uh, growing cranberries in the U.S. 
before diving us into all of the recipes for what you can do with Ocean Spray Cranberries. Uh, although it hasn't mentioned Ocean Spray, but it is from the same company. Cranberry Cherry Mist, Cranberry Jewel Salad, Frozen Cranberry Squares, Cranburgers, again. This one's more extensive. Spicy Cranberry Muffins? I'll come back to the Cranburgers. I will find those Spicy Cranberry Muffins and we will actually read it. Spicy Cranberry Muffins. Um, one cup Ocean Spray Cranberry Orange Relish. A quarter cup of brown sugar, one tablespoon of flour, half a cup of chopped pecans, two cups of packaged bis biscuit mix, uh, three tablespoons sugar, one teaspoon cinnamon, a quarter teaspoon of nutmeg, one egg, and three quarters cup of milk. For the topping, combine cranberry orange relish, brown sugar, flour, and pecans. Spoon one tablespoon of mixture into each of the 12 greased, uh, into 12, each of 12 greased muffin pan cups. For the muffin, stir together biscuit mix, sugar, cinnamon, and nutmeg, stir together egg and milk. Add to dry ingredients, stirring just to moisten. Fill muffin cups two-thirds full. Bake in hot oven, 400 degrees Fahrenheit, for 15 minutes. Remove from oven and invert pan immediately. Makes 12 muffins. Biscuit mix is not an ingredient in your kitchen. Soured cream? I didn't see that, but I trust you it was there. Cranberry hydrochloric acid, great for clearing out clogged drains, snorping boss. Um, I'm confused by this recipe. Does it want me to put the topping in the bottom of the muffin pan and then put the muffin mix on top of that? That seems backwards to me. Um, yeah, I think it's basically just flour and baking powder for muffin mix. I've just, I've never done that with muffins. I always put the topping on top. Like you I put the mix in and then sprinkle the top. So to put the topping in and then put the mix on top, it just feels like it's gonna be oddly shaped muffins. <laughs> Turn that cranberry frown upside down. Yeah. <clears throat> So the Cranburgers here, like I said, slightly more extensive than the, the previous one. Two thirds cup evaporated milk undiluted, two slices of white bread, two tablespoons instant minced onion, one and one half teaspoons of salt, one quarter teaspoon of pepper, and one and one half pounds of ground meat. Um, instant minced onion. That is a product that I've never seen called for. The only place I've ever seen instant minced onion used is McDonald's for their like cheeseburgers, like the small like hamburgers and cheeseburgers. And I don't even know if it was instant, but it was minced onion, like the tiny little onions, at least in the US that you get on like a McDonald's cheeseburger or a McDonald's hamburger. That's what comes to mind when I see instant minced onion. Uh, could just mean dried minced onion. Yeah. Okay. That, that would also make sense. Uh, so pour the evaporated milk over the bread, let it stand to soften. Mix in the onions, salt, pepper, and ground beef. Form into eight patties. Broil six minutes on one side, turn and top with cranberry sauce or cranberger sauce, and broil six more minutes. Serve, these may also be baked. Place in shallow pan and bake 15 minutes at 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Turn, top with whole cranberry or cranberger sauce and bake 15 minutes. Cranberger sauce. One, one pound can of ocean spray jellied cranberry sauce. Five tablespoons A1 steak sauce. Interesting, a brand name steak sauce, or it, it is a steak sauce, it just says A1 sauce, but 
one tablespoon salad oil, and one tablespoon brown sugar. Beat cranberry sauce in bowl with rotary beater until saucy. Beat in remaining ingredients. <laughs> Beat until saucy is an instruction I have never encountered in a recipe before. <laughs> oh boy. Um, okay. I have to move on to the next item, I think. So, uh, Snorf and Boss, it, these, are, um, these are specifically pamphlets put out by the manufacturers. So, like, the, this is the Ocean Spray Cranberry Company that put this booklet out. Um, whether or not uh, A1 is owned by the same parent company at the point in time that this booklet came out, I, I don't know. I don't know the date of this booklet. I don't know whether those two brand names have ever been owned by the same corporation or not. So I don't know about that. Um, but yeah, all of the Ocean Spray Cranberry mentions in here are because they're selling Ocean Spray Cranberry by printing this booklet. Um, so next we have pure cranberry sauce. This one's a lovely little pamphlet, so I, de I definitely want to share it before we move on. Um, ocean spray cranberry sauce, strained and sweetened, individual serving is the little triangle on the knife. That's an individual ser serving. Um, A1 is part of the same company as ocean spray. I'm not surprised, I just don't know when that association started happening, and I don't know what date that book is from. Vine ripened, ready to serve. Sorry, just vine ripened, ready to serve, below the monolith of gelatin that is presented here is just weird to me. Like, vine ripened, yes, the berries are vine ripened. The gelatin is not. And this, to me, reads as a gelatin product and not a berry product. But that's just my read on it. Uh, in here we get, again, a bunch of recipes. Um, muffins, steamed cranberry pudding, baked cranberry pudding, pudding sauce, inas, baked turnovers, ocean spray cranberry sauce, omelet, Cape Cod style, uh, some sandwiches, Yankee Hostess topping, chess cake, automobile lunches, cranberry whip, Thousand Island dressing, cake, eclair, or any filling, pies. Okay, Thousand Island dressing, mix equal parts mayonnaise and Ocean Spray brand cranberry sauce, beet. I don't know what's in Thousand Island dressing typically, but I don't think it's just mayo and cranberry sauce. Uh, that would be amazingly surprising to me if Thousand Island dressing is just mayonnaise and cranberry sauce. But that is the recipe provided here. <laughs> okay, Kira, thank you for confirming that that is not a typical uh, recipe for Thousand Island dressing. <laughs> Cans grow on vines. We all know this. <laughs> Cans grow on vines, jars grow on bushes, cartons grow on trees, and everybody knows this. <laughs> it's a rogue recipe. We grow selected vine ripened cans for can. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. <laughs> I knew what I was doing, but then the sentence betrayed me. Uh, we grow selected vine ripened berries for canning until they are so very dark, mellow, and juicy, they cannot be shipped fresh, but contain more iron, iodine, manganese, and vitamins. Ocean Spray Cranberry Sauce is a solid jelly ready to serve. Fruit Salad, a lettuce leaf, a slice of Ocean Spray Cranberry Sauce, a salad dressing with grated cheese if desired. The rich, dark red color makes a beautiful decoration. 
Cranberry Canners Incorporated, South Hanson, Massachusetts, USA. Bulletin 87. Quoting Wikipedia here, and it fits what your mom told you, Thousand Island dressing is an American salad dressing and condiment based on mayonnaise that can include olive oil, lemon juice, orange juice, paprika, Worcestershire sauce, mustard, vinegar, cream, chili sauce, tomato puree, and ketchup or Tabasco sauce. Yeah, like my brain said probably tomato base or like probably like mayonnaise and tomato in some combination. Uh, paprika also makes sense. Uh, paprika or paprika. Um, Worcestershire sauce, not really surprising. But yeah, uh, cranberry, not something I expected. All right, we've got the American Cranberry Exchange. I mean, mixing mayo and ketchup is definitely a classic sauce. Uh, so much so that uh, not too long ago, people were up in arms because a company decided to make it a brand new sauce for the first time that they called mayo chup and started selling it in our grocery stores, claiming that it was brand new and they had thought it up, uh, which rather upset a lot of people who'd been making their own personal versions of mayo and ketchup mixed together for many decades. <laughs> Ooh, some people also put finely chopped pickle relish in for texture. Yeah, I, I, I thought it always had the pickles in it. Here we have items from the American Cranberry Exchange, which I believe also had another name. Let me see if I can find that. Nope, no other name, Never mind. <clears throat> then they don't need to buy the mayo chip. Yeah, I'd rather buy the mayo and the ketchup and make my own, but uh, cranberries and how to cook them. Look at the beautiful cranberries on the cover of this booklet. <laughs> I love this first page. Why this book is given to you? To make good foods taste better. That's the function of the cranberry. This gay red berry is traditional with turkey, chicken, goose, and it's just as tempting with pork or veal, with ham or lamb. Serve cranberries for color, to bring cheer to your table. Serve cranberries for flavor, a zippy tartness that accents other foods. Serve cranberries to reinforce your menus with vitamin C, with supplementary amounts of iodine and other mineral salts. And no, when you serve eat more cranberries, they're the pick of the season's crop. Look for the box with the trademarked name, Eat More Cranberries. Accepted, American Medical Association. 1938 American Cranberry Exchange and their brand name is Eat More Cranberries. In the Philippines, the combination of mayo and ketchup is called pink ketchup. <laughs> Interesting. Some people use cilantro leaves. Yogurt, yeah. <laughs> uh, Galara, I think it's just that um, people's tastes change as they grow. And sometimes palettes become more sophisticated, sometimes they don't, and there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, eat what you like. But don't get upset at other people because they like different things. Let's see, 10 minute cranberry sauce, cranberry sundae. Arrange individual portions of vanilla ice cream in sherbet glasses and place a generous tablespoon of chilled 10 minute cranberry sauce over each. 
cranberry roly poly, cranberry muffins, crisscross cranberry pie, candied cranberries, cranberry cheese salad. You can tell this booklet has actually been used. Cranberry orange relish, cranberry jelly, cranberry tapioca, raw cranberry and pineapple salad, cranberry horseradish relish, cranberry upside down cake, cranberry sherbet, juice cocktail, cookies, meringue pie, and banana salad, baked cranberries, molded strained cranberry sauce. It's a jello mold! <laughs> People who eat pineapple on pizza are still treated like pariahs. It's not your favorite, but it's not like a mortal sin or anything. And, and that's the thing. If people like it, let them eat it. I'm not personally fond of taco pizza. I don't particularly like chicken on pizza. But I don't get upset at other people for liking those things. Um, I wouldn't say that pineapple on pizza was my favorite, but it's not terrible. And even if I didn't like it, that's no reason that other people shouldn't have it. I happen to particularly particularly like anchovies on my pizza, and a lot of people don't like that. Oh, definitely. Um, I mean, it was given the name Hawaiian pizza, which is definitely a misnomer. Um, pineapples are grown in Hawaii, but they are an import to Hawaii. They are native to South America. Um, but yeah, the I think it's partly a lot of. Um, a lot of Americans know of pineapple as being Hawaiian, um, but also ham uh, and spam is very, very popular in Hawaii. And so if you know anything about Hawaiian cuisine, it tends to have spam in it. So the combination of ham and pineapple together makes people associate it with Hawaii. I'm guessing that's where the name comes from, but I don't know. Um, the Eat More slogan is interesting. I would think somebody, someone trying to use that today would get a letter from a fast food chain's lawyer. Yeah, probably. Oh, yeah, Snorp and Boss. Uh, you discovered baby plum tomatoes gave you the same satisfaction as pineapple on pizza. And see, I don't like, um, I don't like tomatoes on pizza. Like that wouldn't work for me. Tomato sauce is fine, but tomatoes, not again. This is 1938. Was not worth it. <clears throat> so we have a Jello mold from 1938, people. One pound, four cups of Eat More Cranberries, two cups of water and two cups of sugar. Those are all the ingredients. Cook the cranberries in water until all the skins pop open. Strain, add sugar and blend. Boil rapidly for eight to 10 minutes or until a drop gels on a cold plate, 220 degrees Fahrenheit. Transfer to mold and chill. So most gelatins, as you get into the craze of gelatin, um, they're using uh, animal-derived gelatins. Um, this is using fruit pectin, the, the pectin that's naturally in the cranberries as the gelling agent for the gelatin. Shiny Marigold, uh, thank you for being assertive in your belief that pineapple on pizza is a good thing. There's no reason to be upset or fearful about that, at least not on this channel. Um, ripe, red, luscious, eat more cranberries, fresh for your table. Here's where they're grown. On the picturesque lowlands of Cape Cod in New Jersey and Wisconsin, the rich, moist soil produces big, red, juicy cranberries. Here, they come to be sorted. The cranberries are bought, brought into packing sheds and turned over to sharp-eyed inspectors. Here's how they're picked. A special scoop-like rake gathers the cranberries from the vines at peak of quality. Only the best are eat more. Carefully sorted, the finest and best of the cranberries are packed in the boxes labeled eat more, so that when you buy, you can know that you buy the best. Which makes me wonder what, what product were the subpar berries marketed under? Because you know they didn't toss them. You know they packaged them under a different name and sold them.
So I would be curious about like, how else were they doing it? Were they, um, they were most likely in prepared meals or something like that, um, or turned into gelatin and sold as gelatin, although they don't seem to have a gelatin product in their booklet here. Uh, but all right, let's see, time, time, time. Not much time left. Eat more cranberries. Way, tasty ways to serve the tonic fruit. So another booklet with different recipes for eat more cranberries. Cranberry jelly, cranberry mold, a lot of the same kinds of recipes that we've seen already. I just love that brand name though, eat more cranberries. <laughs> All right, uh, let's, how about we, <clears throat> how about we talk stuffing for a few minutes. Eat less. <laughs> All right. Um, so what I have here is a pamphlet from, again, the culinary pamphlet collection. This is from the William G. Bell Company, who made a product called Bell's Seasoning. Makes good food taste better. And you can see the box on the cover has a turkey on it, because this seasoning is particularly targeted at Thanksgiving dressing or Thanksgiving stuffing. I'm just trying to show. <laughs> but can it save bad food? I don't know. A blend of ground sage, marjoram, and spices. So. It's a fold out that folds out four wide. Who wants to bet it's half depleted uranium, one third asbestos, and the rest is arsenic? You know, I mean, the, I don't know what date this is from, <laughs> but there are definitely some carcinogenic things that show up. This is from 1939 uh, in old products. Um, this one not being a um, cure-all, uh, probably not going to have those things, but we did do a couple of episodes if you're interested and you want to go and look at the playlist of old episodes of Archival Adventures um, on the Virginia Tech University Library's YouTube channel. Um, we did an entire month on uh, like folk medicines and um, oh, what's the terminology? My brain will not give me the title, um, but folk medicines and basically fake remedies and, and stuff like that, and my brain just will not give me the actual term. Um, but if you're interested in that, patent medicines. Thank you, Kira. Um, if you're interested in that, we did, f I think, four episodes on that um, this past summer, and the, the VODs of that are up on the library's YouTube. Um, in 1867, William G. Bell, the founder of the company which bears his name, had an idea which proved to be a valuable one. He was watching his mother, whose reputation in New England as a cook was widespread, carefully mix the various herbs and spices to season the stuffing for her Thanksgiving turkey. With her help, he developed a formula for such a seasoning which, after a period of over 70 years, has become known and used both nationally and internationally. For an individual to attempt to duplicate Bell's seasoning, many different spices and herbs would be necessary, which could never be blended with the scientific accuracy of the Bell formula. Herbs from Yugoslavia and from France, spices from Africa, India, the Dutch East Indies, and the British West Indies, each kind chosen for its particular flavor and each grade carefully selected by experts, give Bell's its unique flavor. 
Hand picking at the plantation assures the high quality of the ingredients. Both hand and machine cleaning assure the absolute purity of the product and the blending by one man who for many years has done this work makes certain that it is exactly right. Then the packaging by automatic machinery. Each package wrapped in moisture proof cellophane leaves no chance for contamination or loss of flavor and gives you a seasoning which has been the standard for over 70 years. The use of bell seasoning in the stuffing of poultry, meats of all kinds, vegetables, and in soups, stews, and casserole dishes ensures success in the fine art of flavoring food properly. Okay, but I see a concern here if I was to be looking at investing in this company or really basing anything I wanted to do on their particular formula of spices. It goes through a process where it is blended by one man who has done the work for many years. So what happens when that man leaves or dies? They say that this, has, this recipe is over 70 years old. At some point, either 70 years ago or somewhat relatively more recent, this man came in and, and became an integral part of the process. Which is not great for the future if they are so integral to the process that they're called out in your pamphlet. <laughs> uh, note that hamburgers are known as just hamburgs here. Interesting snorp of us. And, and in the recipe for the Cran burgers, um, they referred to the patties as hamburgs. And that was from like the 1940s, I want to say. Um, at some point, they, like, because they used to just be called hamburgs in the US too. Um, just like all hot dogs were called Frankfurters. Uh, but at some point, the language changed and we call them hamburgers here. Um. So, uh, stuffing or dressing recipes, meat recipes, fish recipes, vegetable recipes, and uses for the seasoning. We'll look at a stuffing recipe, turkey dressing or stuffing, because we are basically at the end of stream and I wanted to close out with something very particular to Thanksgiving since this is the Thanksgiving stream. We didn't really get to look at a whole lot of turkey stuff today, did we? We looked at a lot of cranberry stuff. Um, I have so much stuff here. There's never enough time to look at it all. Uh, a third of a cup of butter, one medium sized onion, chopped fine, a half a cup of chopped celery, uh, one loaf of stale bread, one and one half teaspoons Bell's seasoning, one and one half teaspoons salt, water to moisten. Saute chopped onion and celery in melted butter until onions turn yellow. Break loaf of stale bread into small pieces and moisten with cold water. Add salt and Bell's seasoning and work with hands until of a moist consistency, but not wet. Add sauteed celery and onions and work in well. Let stand about an hour to develop flavor and then use as stuffing for small turkey, about eight pounds. Sausage meat may be added to this stuffing if desired. What's really interesting about this recipe to me is that it is almost identical to the one that I use, except that I don't use this seasoning. Uh, I use Campbell's cream of celery soup and some like sage instead. Like actually, like, but that's because that's what my mom did. And I'm sure she got the recipe from a Campbell's cream of celery soup can. Um, but that is what I grew up eating. And so that's the stuffing that I want. But this recipe is very similar, uh, except for I don't use this seasoning. <laughs> Chopped celery with no mention of which kind of celery, because at the time, the only celery people had was a specific type of celery. I didn't actually know there was different kinds of celery. I, I know like the celery stalks that you go to the store and that are called celery at, at our grocery stores. I am not a cook. I make very few things. I bake, but I don't often need celery for baking. Um, 
Anyway, okay, uh, let's see. It is 4.29, which means that it is supposed to be the time to end this streamy thing that I'm doing. I wanted to look at one thing real quick, if I can. One final thing, just so that we end with turkey instead of stuffing or cranberries. I have an advertisement here. This is from the Agricultural Ephemera Collection. It is an advertisement for poultry. Root celery, very different texture, amazing in curries. Celery sticks last time since they had nothing else. Yeah, I, I was not aware of all of the variety of celeries. So Old and Reliable Mason Produce Company Wholesale Poultry. Established March 1880. Uh, eggs, poultry, and game. Office and sales room 306 South Charles Street, Baltimore, Maryland. <clears throat> Consignments solicited. Quick sales and daily returns made. Uh, this was addressed, uh, it appears, R.A. Moore, Clinton, Virginia, possibly? Um, one U.S. cent. I'm uncertain this may be from 1911. I'm not an expert in reading postage cancellations. It was canceled in Baltimore, Maryland. The numbers present are 9 and 11. I'm guessing that that means September of 1911, but I could be wrong. I am not certain. But this is a basically a postcard advertisement for some poultry. Uh, let's see if it shows up better under without the direct light above it. It does. OK. Um, Mickey, you're too hungry, and you can't get off the pineapple. Pineapple served in half a pineapple hollowed out. C could overlap the one. What's funny is the backdrop is black. The ink is is like a bluish color, but the cloth on the table is black, but it is definitely showing up blue. Um, anyway. Stock version of celery, which most people eat, and then there's root celery, and finally Chinese celery or bara, uh, bara choy. Three hundred six South Charles would be under one of the convention hotels now. So this is their Thanksgiving review. Thirty-two years of continuous operation. So established in eighteen eighty plus thirty-two years. 1880, 1890, 1900, 1910. So 1911 is when this went out uh, because uh, 32 years would put it at 1912, but the postage stamp or the postage cancellation is ends in 11. So this is definitely 1911, 1912 time frame. Um, commission merchants. They give references, the various banks, apparently, that they work with. Uh, market quotations, subject to daily fluctuations. Thanksgiving, kindly ship us turkeys of good quality for this holiday and depend on us for prices quoted on both live and dressed. We tell the prices from old experience and the best information we can gather from the trade we forecast the following prices for Thanksgiving. Dressed turkeys, hens, per pound, 23 cents uh, to 25 cents. Dressed turkeys, young toms, per pound, 23 cents to 25 cents. Old toms, 22 cents to 23 cents. Ordinary turkeys, 19 cents to 20 cents. And then they give ducks, chickens, fowls, and geese, uh, various other meats, some game, including apparently 
partridges, rabbits, wild turkeys, uh, 20 to 22 cents per pound. Saddle venison, whole deer, whole bear, skin on, each $12 to $18. Diamondback terrapin, which is a turtle. Um, furs, ginseng, etc. Mink furs, muskrat furs, raccoon furs, gray and red fox, skunk, otter, ginseng, golden seal, beeswax, and honey. But this is their special Thanksgiving edition with their estimate of what prices will be for turkeys. And they are a wholesaler, so uh, they are soliciting, essentially this would be sent to farmers saying, or farmers or hunters or whatever, saying, here's what we will pay you for the birds if you bring them in. And I think the two different prices are uh, live or, no, sorry, live turkeys are less. Live, live poultry is worth less than the dressed poultry, apparently. If you see turkeys and bunnies running around, they're probably there for the furry con. Oh dear, different kind of dressed poultry though. Yeah, celery seed and celery salt are pretty common, especially for like Thanksgiving flavors. Okay. Apparently an entire bear will, you'll get 12 to $18 for an entire bear with the skin on. All right, uh, that is where we're gonna end it for today. Thank you all for coming by. Um, I hope that you enjoyed the exploration of um, kind of the topic of Thanksgiving. We looked at some menus, we looked at uh, some culinary uh, pamphlets and ephemera, um, and hopefully it was entertaining. Um, we started off by looking at uh, the book Giving Thanks, uh, the Plymouth pa Plantation book, Giving Thanks, um, that I read very limited excerpts from because it's from 2005 and definitely under copyright. So I didn't want to be reading lots of it on air, but that is what we started with. Um, <laughs> whole live bear going $15, take it or leave it. Yeah, probably. Um, so let me see who we're going to raid today. Yeah, I think I think we're going to go to the Monterey Bay Aquarium for the penguin cam today. Um, so we'll go from uh, education here to education there. Um, enjoy the Monterey Bay Aquarium. It is a, a, a nice Twitch channel to spend your afternoon with. Um, I will not be live next Wednesday. Next Wednesday, as I mentioned earlier, the library is closed uh, starting at noon. So um, that is before this stream starts and the building will be locked and I will not be able to get inside. So there will be no stream next Wednesday. Uh, two weeks from today, um, I will be live again on Wednesday, December 1st at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That is World AIDS Day, and we will be looking at some uh, AIDS education-related material from our collections here uh, on World AIDS Day, December 1st. So that is the next time that I will be live. Um, and there was an event that the uh, LGBTQ student organization used to host here on campus called AIDS Awareness Week and we'll be looking at the materials that we have in our collections from that. So I hope that you will join me then. Um, and then as we get into December, we will uh, look at some holiday traditions um, related to midwinter festivals, most likely Christmas. We don't really have a lot on other midwinter holidays in our collections, but the last stream that I do before we shut down uh, for an extended break. Uh, there are two weeks where the building is locked and we can't get in. Um, the last stream that I do before that 
I will be looking at our cocktail collection and be trying to find holiday themed cocktails. So uh, the rest of this year is gonna be a lot of holiday stuff uh, with uh, World AIDS Day being the next stream two weeks from today. I'm gonna go ahead and set up these raids because while I'm talking, I could have been doing that. Um, but yeah, I hope that you will join me for that. I am very, very thankful for all of you stopping by today. Um, There we go. Um, and yeah, thank you all. I hope to see you again. Um, and I hope that you found today to be very interesting and enjoyable. Um, until I see you again, I hope that you have a wonderful um, end of November. And I will look forward to hopefully seeing you again in December. <laughs>